Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Fawcett and then go into hopefully just about 15 minutes or so uh, of information on the gender pay gap and related issues. So, if, in case you don't know who we are, we are a membership organisation. Any one of you can become a member. Please do go online and join. Um, and we're the national charity campaigning for gender equality and women's rights, named after Millicent Fawcett, who is now obviously immortalised in Parliament Square with a wonderful statue. Again, if you haven't been to see her, please do go. Um, courage calls to courage everywhere is the slogan. And some would say, when it comes to closing the pay gap, it takes a bit of courage to do that too. So it's not a bad theme for today's discussion. So I wanted to just talk about why, because I always think it's helpful, even if everyone in the room is really committed to closing the gender pay gap. Probably you're going to have people behind you in your organisations or who you encounter through your working lives who are perhaps less persuaded that this is a good idea. Um, and they may just think it's all down to women's choices and what is the fuss about and all the stuff I get through social media saying, oh, you know, it doesn't exist. We, we still have a lot of sceptics out there and probably within our own organisation. So I think it is important to remind ourselves as to why it's important that we do close the pay gap. And we always think of it as a productivity gap. And that is exactly why, if we're honest, government is persuaded we need to close the pay gap as well. I know there are people in government who are committed to gender equality, but I think there are quite a few people who aren't that committed. And actually what they really want is to get the best outcome for the economy and for society. And actually, this is why. So a lot of the McKinsey data that I've put up here, you can go online to McKinsey's website and, and download all the reports if you haven't seen it already. But it's pretty convincing stuff. Um, so, you know, the business case, if, 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 you've, if you're in the top quarter of gender equality, you're 21% more likely to be profitable. So there's a correlation between, there's probably a causality between that gender representation at the top and profitability. And then we've also got 150 billion added to the economy by 2025, if we close the pay gap. 840,000 more women in work. That makes a big difference to the economy. So at the moment, we're wasting talent and resources by not doing it. And why gender equality and diversity? All the arguments, again, we're used to hearing. But again, it's important that we remember these are the, these are the core reasons why it matters. So it's about being good for business, better decision making at the top of the organisation. In, di in diverse teams, you get better outcomes, better decision making. You don't get the group think that we know can be damaging. More efficient labour market. When I say more efficient, at the moment we've got women working below their potential. A lot of the gender pay gap is effectively women working below their skill level. So that is an inefficiency in the labour market. It's not using their skills and expertise and educational attainment to the full. So by doing something about it, we get a more efficient labour market. We actually get the best person for the job. At the moment, I would argue, we don't always get the best person for the job. And if you set up a system and a structure and you design work in a way which effectively screens some people out of applying or being promoted into it, then by definition, you're not getting the best person for the job. It makes us better connected to our customers and communities. And again, in some organisations, that's particularly important and relevant. But having that connection and representation of the people you seek to serve is really important. And if you believe in equality, as I do, then it's just the right thing to do. So what do we know so far? Um, judging by the uh, GEO website, when I looked at it the other day, it was about 10,500 employers who had reported. So it's a pretty good return, actually. We actually thought it would be lower than that. I, I was quite sceptical when we started out on this journey that we'd get as much engagement as we have. So that's encouraging. 78% um, reporting a gender pay gap. Perhaps not surprising. 14% say they pay women more than men. So it can work in reverse. Over half report gaps of less than 20%, which is kind of where the national average is. Um, and actually, when you look across sectors, um, the figures being reported are actually lower than the sectoral figures that ONS publishes. So obviously, we're not getting all employers through this exercise. We're getting employers with 250 employees or more. So that's screening out a lot of employers, actually, from the exercise. Um, Large employers tend to have smaller gaps, um, and bonus gaps are much bigger. Now, I think this is an interesting one, 
and we'll come back to this in a minute. Um, someone said to me the other day, oh, it's, it's only because we've got part-time workers and full-time workers mixed up together in these numbers. That's why the bonus gap is there. And I'm thinking, well, I don't think there are that many part-timers who really get bonuses in many organisations, actually, if you think about the structure of part-time work. So I don't think that stands up. And it's, if you look at the bonus pay gap figures, I think there is definitely something interesting going on there because sometimes they're, they're double or even more than double the actual pay, this, the salary pay gaps. So what is gender pay gap reporting? Lots of people have called it transparency and I don't really believe it is. And if you actually think about what transparency means, what it would mean if we had full pay transparency in our country, what would that look like? Gender pay gap reporting doesn't give you that because obviously through publishing an average figure, a percentage figure, what you don't get is the detail of what your colleague sitting next to you is actually earning. You're getting an average figure. Um, full transparency would be put all our cards on the table. Let's find out what each person is earning and have that conversation. Obviously, that's you know, culturally within our society quite a challenging thing to do, but it's also been sort of sparked by gender pay gap reporting. So more women are having those conversations in their workplaces and wanting to know what their colleagues are earning. But gender pay gap reporting doesn't give you that transparency, and that's obviously deliberate. They didn't want to create that transparency. But it does give you accountability. It does give you some sense of, well, what are you doing about it as an organisation? What is the pay gap here? Why have we got it? What's your plan? So it does, it does create that conversation. I think it creates ownership on the part of employers, and I think this is really interesting because I think the pay gap itself has always been seen as a national figure we publish outside of an organisation and like somehow it's got nothing to do with us. It's just, you know, we have a national figure, we report it, we say whether it's gone up or down. And actually this exercise brings it into the organisation and people think actually we've got something we can do about this. Um, and it does prompt at least a conversation about action and hopefully some real action on the part of at least some organisations. Um, so what has been the impact? As I say, we think we've started to have a conversation about pay. Uh, and we know that anecdotally teams are saying to us, well, you know, we've just started sharing information. We've just started having that conversation within our teams. So people are feeling more empowered and women are feeling more empowered to question and to challenge. And we think that's a good thing. But we know it's disruptive. And that can feel uncomfortable. And I think, if we're honest, as a lot of people have been saying to us, this is, this is difficult. This is difficult territory. It's, it's opening up all kinds of issues within organisations. So in order to drive change, sometimes you have to go through that uncomfortable patch. And I think that's where we are at the moment. Some women are feeling undervalued within their organisations and they want to know why. Employers are engaging in a way that they haven't before. And some for the first time, some for the first time in terms of looking at this data. Because what this data ultimately is, is insight into your own organisations. It's you know, finding out where women and men are within the organisation, understanding where you've got a gap within one part of the organisation or another. So it gives you some insight into your own organisation. And of course, the interesting bit is what happens next, and that's where we're interested. So we've been saying it's very important to set out a proactive plan. You're not required to publish a narrative and a plan alongside the numbers but it's very wise if you do, because that at least gives you a proactive story to tell. And I know Nick's going to say a little bit more about the comms around this in a minute. Um, but, you know, everyone understands that this is a difficult issue. This is a social issue. This is gender inequality writ large in society that we import into our workplaces. You're not going to solve it overnight, and you're not going to solve it quickly. So we have to try and have a, a comms plan and a, and a plan of action that takes people on a journey with us to try and solve this problem. And I think it's important that as an employer you, you present it in that way. So just trying to get to the, the whys, I think it's important that we do think about this because ultimately whatever shape of it within an organisation, whatever the causes are, most of it just comes back one way or another to these reasons. So occupational and educational segregation, women and men, boys and girls, Educationally taking different subjects, specialising in different areas, going to different sectors of the economy, different professions. Some are valued more highly than others. The jobs that are dominated by men tend to be better valued and, and better paid than the jobs dominated by women. 
we can have a whole discussion about why that is, but that, that's one of the causes of the pay gap. Then you've got vertical segregation. So you've got women stuck in the lower paid parts of the organisation, lower level jobs, and you've got men overpopulating the senior roles. A lot of the experiences of organisations around closing the pay gap will say, well, we can't get enough women into our senior roles. We've got uh, too many women in low paid jobs and the men don't want to do those low paid jobs. Surprise, surprise. So that's why you have um, the pay gap and that's a big factor. And, and often the strategies around this are, are really trying to address that problem. And then you've got the unequal impact of caring roles, which is, you know, life outside of work and how you combine that with work. And how do employers support and enable all their staff, women and men, to do that, to do that juggling act? And are we presuming that some people are going to be doing that and others are not? Are we enabling men to take on those caring roles? What more can policy do to support, can, can practice do to support that? Poor quality part-time work. I always single this one out because I think it's a really important issue. We don't create senior part-time roles in this country very, very routinely or very well. It's very hard to progress in a, in a clear sort of linear way if you want to work part-time. Now, some people say, oh, you just can't do these senior jobs part-time. And I just beg to differ. I don't agree. I think it's the way we design work, and we have to challenge that. And then, of course, we've got discrimination. So not only pay discrimination, which does still exist. There are pay cases going on at the moment, as I'm sure you know. But also other forms of discrimination, which effectively work against women's progress. So sexual harassment. Um, the kind of sex discrimination that women experience within the workplace. And actually that can stop them either getting into a job or progressing in a role. And what that means is effectively that's having an impact on that pay gap. So what can you do? Well, within organisations there are a number of solutions and you wouldn't necessarily need to do all of these at the same time. You might have a plan that says in year one we're going to focus on solution A, in year, year two we're going to progress to solution B, so you can work it through the organisation and think about what are your priorities. But you need to think about every aspect of your sort of people management and progression within the organisation. So what's your recruitment practices and policies? How are you dealing with progression? Do you think about if you've got 40% of women at one level, how are you going to get 40% of women at the next level, for example? Um, active sponsorship, encouraging women to be um, really not pushed as such, but more, than, more active than mentoring, we put it like that. It, a, bit, a bit more kind of encouragement and engagement with those individual women to really help them move up. How, what are your policies and practices? How are you designing jobs? What's your policy on flexible working? Does everyone have a chance to, to do it? Is there a culture of flexibility within the organisation? Do you support DAS to take leave? If so, how, how are they paid? Is it, is it paid at equivalent rate to maternity leave or is it actually uh, a lower rate so they can't afford to take it? Um, and then attitudes. We all bring our own biases. Everyone's got them. How are you seeing those played out in the workplace? How are you challenging those biases? What are you doing to try and unpick the things that might actually be holding us all back? Leadership and role models is important because we know that leaders set a tone for an organisation, they set expectations, they can be challenging in terms of getting other, ones to come, get other people to come on board with the, the journeys that they're trying to take an organisation on. So that is really important. And role models, is, you know, we all know this, but it's really, it is important to, to see people in positions of authority and, and leadership over you that you, know, you can't be what you can't see is the old adage, and it's true. You need, you need to have those role models. And culture, what is, you know, all the things that combine to make up workplace culture, what would you, you know, how would you describe the culture within an organisation? Does it support and enable women to progress, or is it actually not normalising that and normalising something else which is unhelpful? And what should government do? So we're thinking about how we can progress government policy because it isn't all down to employers there's a limit to what employers can do to tackle which is a massive systemic problem but there are things that government can do which would address those causes of the pay gap that I flagged up earlier so how do we get more girls into STEM subjects is it a passive choice is it encouragement enough or do we need to do something more so we auto enroll people into pensions should we be auto enrolling <coughs> girls into science maths and technology subjects if they've got an aptitude Let's present them with that as something that they ought to be choosing. Flexibility by default. 
Every job is a flexible working job unless there's a business reason for it not to be. Longer and better paid dedicated leave for fathers. Share parental leave consultations coming up very soon. We're going to be feeding in that that really does need to change. We need a step change on leave for dads. At the moment, it's massively imbalanced. Better protections from pregnancy discrimination. There are a number of specifics to back that up in our law review, which we published in January. I won't dwell on the specifics of that, but I'm happy to answer questions if you want to. Um, a new duty to prevent discrimination and harassment. This is a bit of a bold one, but again, that was in our law review. We feel we need to step up and build on gender pay gap reporting by addressing what we feel is still far too common an experience for women in the workplace. And time limits on equal pay claims. Those of you who understand equal pay uh, law and equal pay cases will know that they literally go on for years and years and years. And women have died waiting for equal pay. There's no reason why we couldn't put a time limit on them. Um, gender pay gap reporting, next step. So I think we understand that government's going to want to consult and find out from employers um, how it's been for them, for you, um, before they do anything else. So I think there'll be a stage of this which is generally getting feedback on the first year, the first bit of progress. Um, but we're pushing for separating part-time and full-time, so we don't aggregate those figures together including senior partners within the calculations, because we think it's skewed without them. Lowering the threshold down to 50. Um, really, you're only capturing a very small percentage of em employees and employers with a threshold of 250. We think we have to bring that down. Including ethnicity. Now, this is an interesting one. We think we need to at least look at it. Well, it may not be by organisation, maybe by sector, for example. You may need to aggregate some data up. But, you know, the gender pay gap does vary significantly by ethnic group. So we need to understand that because there's multiple factors going on. Sectoral analysis and solutions, we're going to be doing more work at Fawcett, thinking about different sectors and where we could do some specific solution-focused work there. And as I said, a closer, closer look at bonus pay gaps. And this is the gender pay gap by ethnicity that we published. So this is the reason why we want to take a bit of a look at this. So... Um, you've got Pakistani, Bangladeshi and black African women experiencing considerably higher, larger pay gaps than white British women, although white British women are still quite high. And then other groups considerably lower. So we, we, we just need to kind of get underneath the headline figures. And I think that intersectional approach is the future. That's where we need to go because we have to find solutions that work for all women, not for some women. Now, you're going to hear um, from Golian in a minute, but we've been um, working with Golian on uh, providing support for, for companies and organisations. So they've got the communications expertise and we've got the policy expertise that we can bring together to provide um, some consultancy support for organisations who need it. So if you need a, a bit of that, then get in touch and we can, we can help you. And then finally, there's a few references at the end and you'll, you'll get this um, when it's circulated, but just some useful sources of information um, which I've drawn on to, to uh, give you this presentation today. But thank you very much. Thank you.